This is Mike Ashby in Cambridge, and I'm going to present to you today Unit 1 of a set of units which outline and give examples of the use of the CES EduPack. So here is Unit 1, it's the first of the set, and here are some of the things that we would hope students would learn from taking this unit. First of all, an understanding of what's meant by material properties and process properties. Secondly, an ability to find data for these properties and the scientific background to them. And then finally, an appreciation of the value of classification and organization in providing a structure that allows easy access to the information that we've got. Now, at the bottom of this panel, there is a heading resources and uh, it lists the chapters in a couple of books where you, you or the students can find out more about the content of this chapter. These are books that uh, we have written but the CES EduPack and everything I'm going to say is completely compatible with Callister or Budinsky or Askland or Shackleford or any of the others and can be used along with the EduPack resources to support teaching using those textbooks as well. The software that's behind all this is called the CES EduPack software and it's a product of Granter Design in Cambridge. So let's move on to now to the outline. Very brief, a little bit of background, why do we teach materials to engineers at all? Secondly, the classification system for both materials and processes, and then a little introduction to what the software looks like and a start of explaining what you can do with it. You can do a great deal with it, and we'll just do a little of that today. Unit 2 and subsequent units enlarge on this and tell you much more about the things you can do with the software. So why do we teach materials to engineering students? Well, engineers make things, and they make them out of materials, and to do this, they use processes. So what do they need to know to be able to do that? First, they need a perspective of the world of materials and of processes, what materials are available, and what processes, and what are their characteristics. They need to understand a bit about material properties, where they come from, they need an ability to select materials, and as we'll see, there are a very large number of them. Uh, one of the databases we'll see today has 4,000 materials in it, and that means that you need methods and tools, ways of dealing with this large amount of data, in a systematic way to isolate the materials that you want. Well, that's what the CES, CES EduPack seeks to do. It provides a set of resources, not just a database, but other resources too, to help students achieve the four points in the box there. It also becomes a tool for their later professional life. Uh, development of this EduPack tool is now used commercially in industry. Uh, students who've learned how to use the EduPack will be able to move straight onto that without great difficulty. So it's a bit like a computer-aided design or finite element tool. Well, that's just the beginning. What courses might you use this in? Well, it's a very wide range. Uh, material science, general en engineering, polymer engineering, aerospace engineering, architecture, bioengineering, product design, environmental engineering, and most recently, sustainability analysis. Now, that's a very broad range. How do we do that? Well, we have a number you'll see 12 in a minute, different databases, two of them aimed at general engineering, and um, how do we do that? We have a large number of databases, you'll see 12 in a minute, that are adapted to the different subject areas you see there. Two of these are general engineering, and that's what we're going to spend our time with today, the general engineering database. The point I'd like to make, though, is that for the more specialized areas like aerospace or polymer engineering, there is a specialized database that provides the necessary information, but the way the database is used is exactly the same as the way that we will see today that the general engineering database is used. So a student that learns, say, in their first year how to use even the simplest of these databases is equipped to use any of the others. 
Well, how are we going to organize material data? This is the way it's done in the CES EduPack. There is a data table, I'm going to call it for a reason you'll see in a minute, a data table of materials and their properties. And it contains data for metals and alloys, polymers, ceramics and glasses, and hybrid materials, by which I mean composites and foams and anything you can make by mixing two materials together. It contains another data table with information about processes. Processes for shaping, joining and surface treatment, finishing uh, of, a, of components and products. So it has records for a large number, over a hundred processes for doing these things. And these two data tables are linked. That means materials that can be processed in a particular way are linked to those processes, and processes that can handle certain materials are linked to, to those materials. Now, there are in fact two more data tables, one with references saying where the data came from, and one listing suppliers, and these two are linked. So materials are linked to suppliers for that material and the references from which the data came. So I'm going to put a box around that and label this the database. And that's why we call these data tables to distinguish them from the whole package, which is this. Now, the attraction of a structure like that is the following. First, you can select materials by asking for the subset with certain properties. The records for materials have properties, and you can sort on those properties and extract materials with particular sets of properties. You can do the same for processes. You can ask for the processes that have certain characteristics. Uh, and once again, that allows you to select processes based on the content of the records. But you can also select on links. And that's particularly powerful because it allows you to select the materials that can be processed in a particular way, or the processes that can handle a particular material in various different ways. So the selection on links gives us uh, an additional freedom of choice in these databases, which is particularly attractive. Well, let's see what's in there. If we open that one up, the structure looks like this. We call that the material universe. The first level we open that folder of folders for the families, ceramics and glasses, metals and alloys, polymers, elastomers, and hybrids. If we open one of these, that one, say, we find the classes of metals, steels, copper, uh, aluminum, and so forth. Open one of these, and we find the members of the aluminum alloy class. Here's one subset of these. Uh, and if we open this, we begin to get down to the level of a record for various 6,000 series aluminum alloys. So that's what a record looks like, and it has data for density and mechanical properties, thermal, electrical, optical, and a lot more, in including environmental properties. Well, this is what a record looks like, or part of a record. This is what we call structured information, meaning that you can store it in tables, and it's generally numeric in the form you see here. So here is density, and here is the density of ABS, acrylonitride, butadiene, styrene, stored as a range. Now the reason for storing it as a range is that if we had, as in the low-level databases, a single record for ABS, then you have to capture in that single record the various different grades of ABS, and this range covers those grades. At the higher level databases, where we have a lot of individual records for single grades of ABS, the ranges are still there, but they're much narrower because we're talking about one grade now, not uh, a record that covers many grades. Well, as you'll see, there's general properties, including price, mechanical properties, thermal, electrical, optical, processability, eco properties down here, all of them stored as structured information. And at the bottom here are links to the processes that can shape, join, or finish ABS. We'll see those in a minute. Now, there is more to the record than that. There is also what we call unstructured data. 
Unstructured data is also useful in selection, but it can't be stored as tables, tables of numbers the way that uh, you just saw. Uh, here's an example. A, an image is unstructured data for ABS, and it tells you a lot. It tells you that it can be colored, that it can be molded, that it's non-toxic, since kids chew on these things, uh, that it's pretty durable. So that one image is conveying quite a lot of information about the material itself. Unstructured data includes a description of the material, design guidelines, some hints about how to use it, technical notes saying what it is, uh, a ter polymer and so on. Uh, useful here, typical uses. Uh, in a minute we'll see that one of the tools in the software is the ability to search find records by searching and one of the things you can search on is a typical use so a search on safety helmets for instance which is just here a search on that would find ABS and possibly other things as well and here are environmental notes at the bottom well that's what the data for materials look like uh, let's now switch to processes so we're back here and we're going to look at that one examine the content of a record here First of all, the classification, and it parallels almost exactly that for materials. First of all, there are families, joining, shaping, surface treatment. Within any one of these, there are classes, casting processes, molding processes, powder processes. You look at any one of these, and you find members of that class, compression molding, injection molding, and so forth. And once you reach this point, if you open that, you find records for those particular classes, those particular members of the processing universe. What does a process record looks like? Well, here is uh, some of the images that will convey what those different families look like. Primary shaping, like injection molding. Secondary shaping, like machining. Joining processes like welding, and finally surface treatment processes like painting, for instance, plating, and so forth. These are images from the records, so you can retrieve these images from the records in the software itself. Here's what a record itself looks like. Uh, this is part of a record for a surface treatment process, in this case surface hardening, flame hardening. Uh, there is some numeric data. What can you use it for? How big a part can you treat? Uh, what are the economics of it like? And there is a description up here. And there are links to the materials that can be treated in that way. Carbon steels, largely. Good. Well, that's what the internal structure looks like. Now, let's now go to the database itself. The CES EduPack contains the software system that we're going to be dealing with in this and subsequent units, but it contains much more than that. It includes 25 PowerPoint lectures, of which this is one. It's the first one. It includes a set of white papers that describe the databases for aerospace and polymer engineering and environmental design and sustainability design, that sort of thing. It contains a set of some hundreds of teaching resources which we'll look at in a little more detail at the end of this talk and finally it uh, carries references to a set of textbooks which are designed to work with the CES EduPack uh, there's an elementary text, there's one on, on environmental design, there's a more advanced mechanical design there's an industrial design text and there's a text on sustainable development materials and sustainable development. Now, as I emphasized early on, uh, these texts work well with the EduPack, but so too do the texts, the well-known texts by Callister and Shackelford and others. And there is uh, the, the set of resources you see here can be used equally well in teaching uh, from those textbooks. Right, let's open the software, this thing here, and see what's inside. When you open it, what you see is a set of 12 databases that uh, are available for those various areas that I spoke about, polymer engineering, aerospace, and so forth. 
Here are the, here's the simplest one of all. The introductory databases are on this side and the more advanced ones are on the right. Uh, this one is aimed at high schools and possibly first year college education. It has 69 materials and 74 processes. Level 2 is a good starting point in a university course. It has rather more materials, 100, and uh, rather more processes, 115. It also has more information in the records. The records are longer and they contain more data. Once students get familiar with it, uh, there are two more databases I'm going to mention. One is a database of the elements of the periodic table useful for all the basic standard stuff about the elements. And there's the level three engineering database, which now is aimed at third and fourth year projects, masters level topics, and possibly research. Uh, and it contains now nearly 4,000 materials and 246 processes. So it's, mu it's much bigger. It's not a very good place to start because there's so much information there. But when uh, students are doing projects and they need real data for real materials, then then uh, this is the place to go. I won't mention the others. These are the ones that cover those other topics that I spoke about. A particularly exciting one is the sustainability database. Right, let's now see how you can use it. When you open the software, this is the toolbar that appears across the top of the screen. And it has three buttons here, browse, search, and chart select. I'm not going to talk about the chart select button in this unit. That's the subject of unit two. Uh, what we're going to do is look at these two. So if I go back to browse. Browse opens a set of records or the folders contained in the data table. And these, each of these folders now contains data for the words you see here, ceramics, hybrids, metals, polymers. If we open one of them, we see the class names, elastomers, thermoplastics, thermosets. Uh, open one of those, and you begin to find the members of that class. ABS, we saw a minute ago, but there are lots more. I've just put some examples here. Click on the name, and the record appears. So finding data is as simple as that. You simply find your way, browse your way through the materials tree, as we call it, because it's got these thick branches at the bottom and the thinner ones with many different records in further up. Browse your way through the tree until you find the one you want and click on it, and that produces the record. At the bottom of the record is the link to processes. I'm going to click on that. There it is. If I click on that, the system finds all the processes that can do anything to ABS, of which this is one. I just chose one of them. Injection molding, that's what the record looks like. Here's some numeric data. There's more stuff of which this is an example, including a cost model. And at the bottom, in the process records, are the links to the materials that can be injection molded. So if I click on that, it takes me back to a list of materials that can be injection molded, of which ABS was one. So I've just clicked on ABS and come back to where I started. So that is the browse routine. The second button we want to look at is the search routine. That's here. If I click on search, the system provides a search window in which you can enter a name. If you enter a name like titanium, it will find a record called titanium. That's not terribly clever. But if you enter something that is not a record name, like plexiglass, for instance, uh, it finds the material, it searches all the records, full text search of all the records. And within this record for PMMA acrylic, it found the word plexiglass. And so it is produced, it has brought up that record. So you can search on uses, on trade names, uh, on anything that you might expect to find in a materials record, and the system will then find it. Now, in the learning objectives, we mentioned the idea that students should know something about material properties, and the software is able to help you there. These little symbols 
I, I, I down here, each provide information about the property that's listed here. Uh, one final point about the search routine is that it's pretty flexible. It's not case sensitive and you can use operators with it uh, and it highlights the words it found in the data sheet itself. Now returning to the information about material properties, uh, here's another record, ABS again, and here are these little buttons here. If we click on any one of these, we get a page of notes about that property, Young's modulus in this case, uh, how it's measured, how you define it, where it comes from. This one page here is one of about three which give background information on Young's modulus. And at the bottom of each one of these pages, every field has one, uh, is a list of the chapter headings in Callister, Budinsky, Asklin, Shackelford, and so forth, where you can find more about this property. So if this is the text that you're using in the course, the student is then directed to the relevant chapter of that text. Now, all the records in all the databases look like this. If you open the aerospace database or the sustainability database or any of the others, the records would look like that. You find them in the same way. You search them in the same way. They all have these little I buttons which explain what the properties are. And in the case of sustainability and some of the others, uh, that's really quite important because some of the properties are somewhat obscure and it's very helpful to have a careful definition accessible to the student immediately. Now that's a good introduction to what the database can do. I'm just now going to show you a few extra little buttons here. One called Settings and one called Help. Settings allow you to customize many aspects of the system to suit your own purposes. Uh, first of all, it's possible to show not just one data sheet, like the ones we've been looking at, on the screen, you can show as many as you like on the screen at the same time, although of course there's limited room for more than about two or three. To do that, you have to click the Allow More Than One Data Sheet window. Uh, charts I won't talk about because that comes in the next unit. Uh, units. The system allows you to choose the units you want to work in. The default is metric. You can choose the currency for the prices from the world's currencies. Uh, you can adjust the preferred unit system to imperial if you wish to, and you can uh, indicate whether you want temperatures indicated in uh, centigrade, Fahrenheit, by changing the units, or Kelvin, absolute temperature scale here. You can change the way the numbers are shown. Um, first of all, the number of significant figures. This is set at three, but you can set it at anything you like. And secondly, another useful feature is that, uh, as you saw, data is stored as ranges. Sometimes it's more convenient just to have an average value. If you click on display data ranges as average values, then they're all condensed down to one number instead of two. Well, there's more you can do, but that has largely to do with uh, charts, so I'll leave those for the moment and instead go to Help up here. Help gives access to a large number of other resources, and some of them are listed here. Video tutorials, teaching resources, and so on. So if we click on the top one, Help, uh, it gives a screen with six panels. The panels allow you to go to a quick start getting started guide, various tools. Uh, here at the bottom is student resources. If I click on that, the system brings up a set of resources that are accessible to students. And they include a little teach yourself phase diagrams unit, a little teach yourself crystallography unit, a little booklet of material properties, a booklet about writing papers, which students seem to find useful and a lot of other stuff. So this is resources aimed directly at the student. There's a whole set more that are aimed at the instructor, and we'll get to those in a minute. I'll go back to help and go down to the second one, video tutorials. There's a comprehensive set of short 
three to five minute video tutorials on getting started, making charts, selection, advanced use, and that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, it's a considerable list. This lists the video tutorials. Then finally, there are teaching resources which can be accessed in a number of different ways by clicking when within the software by clicking on teaching resources on the web that takes you to the Granta Design website with access to the PowerPoint units I mentioned, to the white papers, to many other resources. You can also reach them by going directly, you don't need the software for this, to this website. And that brings up resources which include exercises with worked solutions, other lecture units beside the 25 that we offer, white papers, selection case studies, webinar recordings, posters, sample eco audit project files. That won't mean anything at this point, but they're useful later on when doing environmental studies and other databases than the ones you've just seen. They can be accessed in a number of different ways by subject, by type, by edition, by language. They're there in three languages and by level. Well, that brings me to the end of this first introductory lecture. I'll just summarize where we've been. First of all, classification, important, lets materials, uh, gets materials data in an organized manner and in a manner that can be easily retrieved. You can find things easily. The data, as you saw, takes two broad forms, both of them useful. One is numeric, what we call structured data, the other is text, images, graphs, which we call documentation, and that too is useful when we come to do selection. Finding records can be done in one of two ways, by browsing, as you saw, or by searching. And finally, the underlying science is provided via science notes, uh, white papers that you can access from the help file, and the references to leading texts, as you saw just a minute ago. Good. With that, I will bring this unit to an end, and I hope that you have enjoyed it sufficiently to tackle the next one, Unit 2. Thank you.